Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome. My name is Diane Knispel. I'm the Director of Education at the Park City Museum. Um, welcome to our lecture series. Um, we are going to have a uh, lecture tonight. We have one in August. And check our website for what um, we decide to do or what the lectures are. Some, some are going to be in person and some are going to be, um, uh, uh, hopefully in the future, we'll have both Zoom and in person, but we're working on the technology part of that. And we hope to have that in place sometime soon. I just don't know when. So, um, but right now we are working on uh, in person. So, um, and then when we have the Zoom and in person, we'll let you all know. So thanks for coming tonight. I'm going to introduce our guest speaker and we'll take it from there. And I'm going to keep letting people in as they come in. So um, Brian Andreessen earned a JD from Cornell University and a PhD in 19th century American history from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. For most of his career, he was a research historian at the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library and Museum in Springfield, Illinois, where he curated ex exhibitions, directed research, and conducted seminars and public programming. Brian helped create the Looking for Lincoln Heritage Coalition, a 501c3 corporation that pioneered heritage tourism in Illinois. And he authored the feasibility study on which Congress based legislation creating the Abraham Lincoln National Heritage Area. For 10 years, he was editor of the Journal of Abraham Lincoln Association, the premier scholarly journal in the field of Lincoln studies. Currently, he is a historian at the Church History Museum in Salt Lake City, Utah. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Brian. Brian. Well, thank you. Um, I'm not quite sure why I was invited to be part of your series, but I'm very happy that I was. And anytime I get to talk about Lincoln and Illinois, it makes me happy. And I'm especially happy to hear that at least somebody on here is from Illinois and may, may actually uh, know about some of these places that we talk about. So it's been a little over 20 years ago now that uh, the Looking for Lincoln Heritage Coalition was created to help uh, Lincoln to tell Lincoln history in the various counties of Central Illinois, where Lincoln lived and worked and traveled as a lawyer and as a politician. At one of my first assignments in connection uh, with what would later become the Abraham Lincoln National Heritage Area was to develop a concept and a plan by which various communities and historic sites across the, uh, read the heritage area could share their Lincoln stories with visitors. But you know, landscapes have changed dramatically since Lincoln's time, and it makes it difficult for people today to imagine Lincoln's world. So to help people exercise their historical imagination, Looking for Lincoln decided to create a network of wayside storyboards. Now these storyboards uh, connect the region's many, many Lincoln stories and anecdotes to the physical locations where they occurred. Initially, we focused on downtown Springfield, Illinois as a pilot demonstration project, a kind of model that other communities with Lincoln stories could follow. So researching Lincoln stories and anecdotes in Springfield became my job. And we had obtained this uh, satellite photo of downtown Springfield. And I used it to match 75 stories and anecdotes to their physical locations. And then I picked uh, 50 locations that I researched and wrote storyboards for them. Uh, and I used this dual story theme for each storyboard. One story would focus on something about Lincoln, the person. The other story would focus on something regarding the Springfield world that Lincoln knew. So it's Lincoln Springfield and, and Springfield's Lincoln uh, dual theme. So through this dual storyline, I was able to use Lincoln stories to introduce visitors to various social history and cultural history themes. Now you can learn a lot of things uh, researching and writing public history projects that you don't necessarily learn in a PhD graduate program. And doing the Springfield storyboards helped me to realize that in a big hurry. For example, did you know that Abraham Lincoln believed in the use of madstones? Do you even know what a madstone is? 
you know, I didn't know until I started uh, research for the Springfield Waysides. A madstone is a calcified hairball from the gut of an animal. It's usually gray or greenish blue, a kind of rock. And if you get bitten by an animal that has rabies, you know, think about the classic dog story, Old Yeller. Well, you wanna run and find somebody that has a madstone and you take the madstone and you drop it into a pail of milk and you swish it around and around. And then you place it on top of the uh, bite, uh, the, the wound. And, and the stone will adhere to the wound and it becomes more saturated while it sucks out the toxins and it turns more gray or green and eventually it falls off. And then you pick it back up, you put it back in the bucket, you swish it around in the milk some more and then you stick it back on the wound. And you keep repeating this cycle until the stone doesn't adhere to the wound anymore. And if you do it right, you don't get rabies. Now, when I first heard about using mad stones to cure rabies, I didn't think about Abraham Lincoln, uh, Mark Twain maybe, uh, Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn tying a string to the tail of a dead rat and swinging it around their heads at midnight under the full moon to cure warts or something like that. But Abraham Lincoln? So how do we know that Lincoln believed in mad stones? Well, through oral histories collected by Lincoln's last law partner, William H. Herndon. You see, after Lincoln was killed, Herndon went all around Illinois and Southern Indiana and areas of Kentucky, and he interviewed people who had known and interacted with Lincoln over the course of his lifetime. And one of those people that he interviewed was Lincoln's sister-in-law, Frances Todd Wallace, the sister of his wife, Mary Lincoln. They were talking about Lincoln and animals. And Francis didn't think that Lincoln was all that fond of dogs, for example. Uh, cats maybe, but, but not dogs. Because there was the time that Robert Lincoln, uh, the Lincoln's oldest son, was bitten by a mad dog. And Lincoln bundled his son up, son up and they jumped into the carriage and they raced eastward across the prairies for two days to get to Terre Haute, Indiana, where he knew a person that had a mad stone and Robert didn't get rabies. Now, if, if you're a careful historian, you try to corroborate these kinds of reminiscent oral accounts. So is there something that can corroborate this oral evidence about Lincoln believing in mad stones? In this instance, there is. Joseph Gillespie was a political and legal associate of Lincoln's from Alton, Illinois which is just a little up the Mississippi River from St. Louis, Gillespie sent a letter to Herndon independent of Francis Wallace's account. He was, dis and, and, and Gillespie was discussing Lincoln's success as both a lawyer and a politician and how his quality of understanding and respecting common country people was a key. So it was in this context that he brought up Madstones. Let, let me read you for, uh, from Gillespie's letter. Uh, he, meaning Lincoln, had great faith in the strong sense of country people, and he gave them credit for greater intelligence than most men do. He had great faith in the virtues of the Madstone, although he confessed that it looked like superstition. But he said he found the people in the neighborhood of these stones fully impressed with a belief in their virtues from actual experience. And that was about as much as you could ever know of the properties of medicines. So when, when you consider in this context, uh, the Madstone story, it, it seems less like a backward looking superstitious rural subsistence farmer, Lincoln. And instead it looks more like a forward looking man of the enlightenment, applying reason and scientific method and experimentation and observational deduction. So what can we learn about Lincoln from the Madstone story? Well, I included it in the Springfield Looking for Lincoln book because it teaches us that Lincoln was a man of two worlds. He had one foot in the old traditional world of the Upland South 
the world of Mark Twain and Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn and of superstition and folkways and folk magic. And he had another foot in the new modern world of the industrial revolution of science and technology and engineering. Uh, kind of as an aside, you know, I, I think if, if Lincoln was alive today, he would probably not be a politician, uh, given the state of our politics. He, he, he would be an engineer. He loved math, he loved engineering and those kinds of things. And the opportunities would be great in that field today. Uh, that's just my conjecture. Uh, so the fact that Lincoln had a foot in both the old traditional world and the new modern world meant that he could understand and relate to and talk to people from both worlds. And that was one of the keys to his success. Now let's shift to a different Springfield story. This one having to do with public entertainments in Lincoln's day. And they consist, consisted of such things as political speeches and rallies and debates religious lectures and, and church socials, and civic events like agricultural fairs, militia drills, circuit court days, parades, dinner parties, and public performances, uh, things like plays and concerts and lectures and dances and traveling circuses. You know, in the early years of Springfield, the venue for these things tended to be out of doors in shady groves of trees or, or perhaps in church buildings. And later the state capitol building was sometimes used for these kinds of public functions. Eventually a few assembly halls or buildings with second story auditoriums were built. And one such building was Cook's Hall in downtown Springfield on 6th Street, directly across the street from the State Capitol building. It was dedicated in December 1858, the year that Lincoln lost to Stephen A. Douglas in their famous US Senate contest that included the famous Lincoln-Douglas debates. So soon various singers and theatrical companies and dance troops were coming to Springfield to perform in Cook's Hall. National celebrities like Ralph Waldo Emerson and Horace Greeley, Henry Ward Beecher, Theodore Parker. <clears throat> These kinds of people came to town and gave well-attended lectures. Well, I included Cook's Hall in the Springfield Looking for Lincoln book because it provides a portal into the public culture of Lincoln's world. In particular, let's use Cook's Hall as a way to gauge what common folks were concerned about on the eve of the Civil War in the year 1860. Now you'll remember that year was a watershed in American politics. The Democratic Party was splitting apart. The Republican Party was still struggling to consolidate itself. Threats of Southern secession from the Union were in the air. And of course, we know that the Civil War was just months away. But what about the people then? you'd think that politics would be the all-consuming fear and passion of the time, right? Well, research on Cook's Hall gives us a feel for what the public in Springfield was preoccupied with as the country was unraveling all around them. In February, Lincoln had delivered his Cooper Union Address back in New York City that had uh, elevated him to be a legitimate, if still kind of a somewhat long shot candidate for the Republican presidential nomination. But by March, he was back in Springfield tending to political emergencies as the Illinois Republican governor, William Henry Bissell was slowly dying in the state's executive mansion. Meanwhile, who swept into town and captured the public attention? The international celebrity, Lola Montez. She was kind of like the era's Madonna and Evita, Scarlett O'Hara, Catherine uh, Zeta-Jones, all kind of rolled into one. Born Eliza Rosanna Gilbert in Ireland in the early 1820s, the daughter of, of a British military officer, she grew up in India with stints of education back in England. And as a teenager, she left home and became a dancer in Spain. She assumed the stage name of Lola Montez and became romantically involved with a Spanish nobleman 
and several others in France and various places. She carried pistols and daggers in her petticoats. She became the mistress of the King of Bavaria who made her the Countess of Landsfeld. She had great influence in court politics, but she had to flee the country when the King was forced to abdicate and she returned to England and married a military officer, but she was charged with bigamy and had to flee that country as well. So in the 1850s, she came to America where she resumed her career as a popular dancer and actress, including a tour of Australia. And she became notorious with American audiences for her erotic spider dance as depicted by this cartoon lampooning puritanical New England men leering from the audience. Now, for any of you who are longtime Jeopardy fans, you might remember that before Ken Jennings, there was uh, Bruce Seymour, who back in the late 1980s and early 1990s was a super winner in Jeopardy, won hundreds of thousands of dollars playing Jeopardy. And he took that money and traveled the world in order to write a book on Lola Montez, published by Yale University Press, if, if you can believe it. Uh, so what international celebrity would you pick if you were to win a lot of money on Jeopardy and decided to write a book about a celebrity? Now, I never considered playing Jeopardy to, to finance my historical research. I've always grubbed around trying to get research grants. I guess that was my mistake. Uh, anyway, this is how Lola looked when she appeared at Cook's Hall in Springfield in March of 1860. By that time, she was in her 40s and touring the country as part of an American lecture series. Her topics included beautiful women and wits and women of Paris and fashion, which is the lecture she delivered in Springfield. Well, she packed Cook's Hall on March, uh, March 14, 1860. Uh, not everybody was a fan. One of her critics was William H. Herndon, the law partner of Lincoln's who later collected the oral histories. It turns out that Herndon delivered a lecture in Springfield a few days after Lola, and he didn't attract near the crowd that she did. So in a sulking mood, uh, he wrote an anonymous article for the newspaper in the neighboring town of Petersburg, all about the situation. Let me read you that article. Uh, the semi-weekly Axis, Petersburg, Illinois, Wednesday, March 21st, 1860. On Friday last, W.H. Herndon addressed the Library Association of Springfield, the sweep of commerce being his subject. The lecture had been duly announced and notwithstanding the known ability of the man and the importance of his theme, as usual on such occasions in the capital city, he did not obtain a respectable audience. For a few days prior, the notorious Lola Montez, a disgrace to her sex and almost clothed in male apparel on short notice, delivered an address and about 500 of the elite of the capital city greeted her in audience. It is a stain upon the state that talent is so little regarded in that city as to not give their own votaries a decent hearing. Now, poor Herndon. Uh, Lola was pretty tough competition for public attention. Uh, she died in 1861 in her 40s from the effects of syphilis. Well, in April, Lincoln was busy sending out political letters for his presidential campaign and delivered an important speech in Bloomington, Illinois. But what were people really talking about? Heavyweight boxing. American heavyweight prize fighter John C. Heenan was in England to fight the English champion, Tom Sayers. Now this was the era of bare knuckled boxing, no boxing gloves. Tom Sayer was 5'8", 149 pounds. John C. Heenan was six foot two, 195 pounds. They fought on April 17th. 1860 in an outdoor ring east of London near the village of Farnborough in Hampshire in what has been dubbed as the first world title boxing match. 
the luminaries like Charles Dickens and William N. Thackeray, the Prince of Wales, the Prime Minister Lord Palmerston, they all attended, even though such boxing matches were prohibited by British law. The fight went on for 42 rounds, two hours and 20 minutes before the police broke it up. By the end, both fighters were exhausted with bleeding eyes. The fight was declared a draw. The fighters shared the 4,000 pound purse. You know, I, I personally think that Tom Sayers, who was what, 50 pounds lighter and six inches shorter probably should have won the decision, but it was a tie. Well, the result of all this was the creation of the Marcus of Kingsbury rules for boxing, a version of which is still in use today. Now, how is this fight arranged? By the beautiful wife of John C. Heenan, the American actress and poet, Ada Isaac Mencken. Ada was a famous New Orleans dancer and actress and poet, uh, a self-promoter extraordinaire who became a very famous celebrity along the East Coast, a kind of next generation American Lola Montez. She took her act out west and made a great sensation when she was captured by American Indians. On returning to New York City, she temporarily fell in love with John C. Heenan, America's most famous celebrity athlete at the time, and they married. Well, with a keen eye toward promoting her own career in Europe, she helped arrange for her husband's world championship bout with Tom Sayer in England. But more on Ada in a minute. And back to Heenan and the role of sports celebrities in politics. New York Senator William Seward was the front runner for the 1860 Republican presidential nomination. And he happily used Heenan in his political campaign. Now Heenan was associated with the Bowery Boys gang in New York City. You might remember Martin Scorsese's hit historical movie a few years, uh, 20 years ago, the, the Gangs of New York. Uh, well, that'll help give you a feel for uh, Heenan and the Bowery Boys and his background. And his celebrity status helped gain working class voters. So then when Lincoln unexpectedly won the nomination, Republicans used Heenan to campaign for Lincoln. Now, let me share uh, newspaper reports regarding, he, uh, regarding uh, Heenan visiting Springfield in October, not long before the election in 1860. And let me share a newspaper report um, about that. The first one is, is from Springfield's leading Republican newspaper, the Illinois State Journal, dated October 27th, 1860. The Benicia Boy in Springfield. The Benicia Boy was the, the nickname that Heenan went by. John C. Heenan arrived in our city on Thursday evening and stopped at the St. Nichols Hotel. Yesterday, he paid a visit to Mr. Lincoln, of whom we are informed he is a warm admirer. It is probable that the Benicia Boy's famous motto, may the best man win, explains his preference for Mr. Lincoln in the great contest now pending. The rumor that he was in town created a deal of excitement among all classes, but few, however, were gratified with a glimpse of the champion of the world. He is a remarkably fine looking man and it is no wonder that the beautiful Ada Isaac Mencken is inclined to claim him as her own peculiar property. Well, those words peculiar property were code words for slavery. That was a way of saying that uh, Heenan was, was uh, Ada's own peculiar slave. Well, next let's read from the Democratic newspaper from the state capitol, the Illinois State Register on the same date. John C. Heenan's shadow in Springfield. Some inventive genius sent a rumor afloat that the great American champion of heavyweights, John C. Heenan, arrived in our city yesterday. A crowd of ragged boys with a sprinkling of hot-headed men, young as well as old, were to be seen running around the streets, eager to get a glimpse of the hero of Salisbury. This morbid curiosity, this eagerness to elevate to the dignity of a hero and noted bruiser, 
reflects little credit on the good sense and taste of our fellow citizens. The world must be going daft mad. So there's the Democrat sour grapes that it was the Republicans who had beat them to getting the endorsement from the most famous uh, uh, athlete of, of the time. Uh, so they had to ridicule him in the sport of boxing um, to make up for it. Well, regardless of whether or not Heenan was in Springfield in October, it's certain that he was in Springfield on December 1st, not long after the election, when he held an exhibition match at Cook's Hall. The newspaper broadside advertised that an excellent band would be on hand to provide music, and the warm-up act would be the amazing Gregory, the modern Hercules, the strongest man in the world, who would carry 10 men on his back while also carrying two 54-pound weights in each hand. Now, that would be worth watching even if you didn't like boxing. Now, here is what the Illinois State Journal had to say about Heenan's appearance in Cook's Hall. Cook's Hall was crowded to an early hour and never before in the city of Springfield has there been such a general turnout of the fancy and sporting men of the town. There was plenty of Heenan enthusiasm and unrestrained pugilistic ardor in the house. After the fight, it was announced from the stage that Heenan and Jones on arriving in St. Louis would go, in, go into a hospital under the care of a surgeon to recuperate from the injuries of their their bout. So the big question, did Lincoln and his boys attend Heenan's exhibition match at Cook's Hall? Well, the historical record is silent. Lincoln, with his talent for frontier wrestling and his love of athletic contests, probably would have liked to have gone. But if Mary Lincoln had anything to say about it, she would likely have stopped the president-elect from attending such a low-class, undignified event. Certainly she would have prevented her young sons from going. And what of Ada Isaac Mankin? Disappointed that her husband hadn't clearly, clearly defeated his British foe, she continued her theatrical career in New York City. In 1861, she opened in an extravagant adaption of Mazeppa. Mazeppa was based on a historical legend popularized in a long romantic poem by Lord Byron. It's the story of Mazeppa, a handsome Ukrainian court page who had an affair with a Polish countess and was discovered by her husband, who had him stripped naked and tied to a wild stallion that then galloped off with him into the mountains and boundless plains of the Ukraine to meet a helpless fate at the mercy of wild animals and wild Cossacks. Well, Mazeppa's banishment came to symbolize the fate of unfaithful people in places of trust and the fate of political tyrants. Macon's version featured a female Mazeppa and introduced innovative special effects that wowed New York audiences on Broadway climaxing in Ada being strapped to a live horse who galloped down the theater aisles and up into the rafters above the stage on a series of ramps to replicate galloping up into the mountains. But the innovation that caused the biggest stir, especially among Civil War soldiers on furlough in the big city, was Ada's costume. Let me read you this entry from a book on the history of important uh, dates and in burlesque uh, in America. This is 1861, an important milestone was Ada Isaac Mencken's ride across the stage in pink tights and a short tunic strapped to the back of a live horse in the character performance of Byram's poem, Mazeppa. Mencken apparently innovated the style of tights tailoring hers to the close fitting body stocking of today. And assisted by sound, movement, and light, she seemed to the eager imagination of the audience to be actually naked be beneath her short, flimsy tunic. The removal of her cloak, partially shielded by actors, has been called by some the first public striptease act ever witnessed in a theater. Well, later during the war, in 1863, out in San Francisco, Ada went a step further and abandoned tights altogether wearing only a blouse and a pair of modest shorts. 
She may be the first woman in American theatrical history to bear her legs. Well, just like the great New York Yankee slugger Joe DiMaggio's marriage to Marilyn Monroe didn't last, neither did John C. Heenan's marriage to Ada Isaac Mencken. In fact, it didn't even last through the Civil War. Before she even formally divorced, Ada married the popular New York writer of political and cultural satire, Robert Newell, whose pen name was Orphus C. Kerr, or office seeker. Abraham Lincoln was a great fan of Newell's humor, and he religiously read Orphus C. Kerr's articles. In fact, Lincoln even invited him to the White House on one occasion. Now, we don't know if Ada went along, which would have been a great irony, because she was a firm copperhead. That is, she was an anti-war critic of Lincoln and the Republicans and a Southern sympathizer. Well, Ada didn't stay with Robert Newell very long either. And after the war, she toured Europe, a kind of Lola Montez in reverse, and became entangled with literary elites like Charles Dickens in England and Alexander Dumas in France. She died in Europe at the age of 33 of cervical cancer. So, this is the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library and Museum in Springfield, where I used to work. Its collection of Lincoln manuscripts and prints and books and artifacts is incredible. One of the most compelling collections is the political cartoon collection. Many of the political cartoons during the Civil War were highly critical of Lincoln. To showcase this collection of political cartoons, the museum designers created what we call the Whispering Gallery. It was designed to make visitors feel unbalanced and out of kilter, reflecting how Lincoln felt, both emotionally and psychologically, as he was bombarded from every direction with criticism. Our political cartoon collection was a gold mine for creating this section of the museum exhibit. But let me show you one cartoon that the designers did not let us use because they didn't think anybody would understand it. Yep, Lincoln as Mazeppa. 21st century audiences don't have a clue what this means, but anyone from the 19th century would have known exactly what it meant. Thanks less to Lord Byron than to the most famous wo woman on Broadway during the Civil War, Ada Isaac Mencken. This cartoon was an attack on Lincoln as an unfaithful and corrupt leader who deserved ostracism rather than re-election. It was a very powerful anti-Lincoln cartoon based on the popular culture of his time. And now you're privy to one of the cura uh, curatorial mysteries that confronted the creators of the Lincoln Presidential Museum, that is the meaning of this cartoon. But one lesson to be learned is just how ephemeral popular culture really is. Events and people that command universal attention from entire nations soon fade and disappear from memory. And their meaning and importance to entire generations are, ultima are ultimately largely lost within just a few decades. But recovering and solving these kinds of cultural mysteries is part of the fun of diving into history. So you never know what you're going to learn while looking for Lincoln, what unfamiliar story you may encounter, whether it be about mad stones or antebellum international prima donnas uh, celebrities like Lola Montez or nationally known sports celebrities like John C. Heenan or beautiful self-promoters like Ada Isaac Mencken willing to push the boundaries of decency and good taste, or presidents who are lampooned through popular culture of their time. While it's true that popular culture is constantly changing and ephemeral, the more th some things change, the more some things stay the same. And though names and faces have changed, the symbiotic relationship between politicians and sports and entertainment celebrities remains the same today. Now I invite everyone to visit the many Looking for Lincoln venues in the Abraham Lincoln National Heritage Area, 
Information is available at the Looking for Lincoln website, including brochures like this one. For those with Latter-day Saint connections, notice that Nauvoo is within the National Heritage Area and is included in the Story Trail program network. In fact, I was also asked to write the second book in the National Heritage Area book series published by Southern Illinois University Press, which is Lincoln and Mormon Country, which is a guidebook to all of the Lincoln connections to Latter-day Saint history in Illinois. In addition to these first two books in the series that I wrote, there are currently two others, a Guide to Lincoln's Eighth Judicial Circuit by Guy Fraker, which incorporates stories about Lincoln the lawyer, and Historic Houses of Lincoln's Illinois by Erica Holst, which tells stories from various houses and historic sites that were part of the landscape in Lincoln's time. Any or all of these books will help you prepare to make the most of your visit to the Lincoln National Heritage Area, or if you can't get there, it will give you an armchair tour of the heritage area uh, if you can't go in person. So that's, uh, that's my presentation. With that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and uh, turn the time back over to Diane uh, for whatever may happen next. Sure. Um, thank you, Brian. Uh, that was really good. I enjoyed that. I learned a lot today. Um, if anyone has any questions, um, you can either write them in the chat box or you can unmute and just ask because there's not many of us tonight. So uh, feel free. Uh, Brian, uh, I, uh, I read the, uh, the second book you mentioned, The Lincoln and Mormon Country. Can you oh, yeah. make any uh, and um, Wondering if you could make any comments about, uh, I know that the, you, there's no direct evidence that they actually, that uh, Lincoln and Joseph Smith ever met, but you, you hint that they were in the same place quite a bit and wondering if you have any opinions or comments as to whether they actually really did interact personally. Uh, you know, I, I got into that question because uh, when I was in it, at the Presidential Library, uh, if there were Latter-day Saint people that were visiting, the, the first thing I wanted to know is, you know, did, did Lincoln ever know meet Joseph Smith? Because they coincided in time period there in the Nauvoo period in Illinois. And so that drove me to really research that question. And in doing that, discovered that Lincoln was totally involved at the very time that Joseph Smith was in Springfield for his habeas corpus hearing at the federal court, Abraham Lincoln as a lawyer was defending one of the Illinois State Supreme Court justices, Thomas Brown, who was being tried in, in the Illinois House of uh, Representatives for removal from the, from the bench as being incompetent as a judge, uh, kind of like impeachment. And uh, so, that the, the Joseph Smith, Abraham Lincoln question led me into an area of, of Lincoln studies that nobody had ever done before, which is Lincoln's participation in this uh, court drama in the Illinois state legislature. So Lincoln was very much tied up with that. And whether or not he got over to any of the, this, the court sessions that Joseph Smith was attending in the building right next to the state capitol where Lincoln was involved, it is questionable. Uh, however, his wife, Mary, did attend. Um, she, every, everybody wanted to go to the, to, to the trial and see this famous Joseph Smith, see what he looked like. And usually women and, and uh, weren't, they, they, they usually didn't go to the courtrooms. But the courtroom in, in the Tinsley building where the habeas corpus hearing was being held was packed with women, in, including Mary Lincoln. Uh, there were some socials held uh, while Joseph Smith and, and was there that, that it's, it's possible they might have run, run into each other. Um, so it, I think, I, I think it, it's, it's not unlikely that in some fashion Lincoln met uh, Joseph Smith. 
But of course, Joseph Smith and the people at the time had no idea that Abraham Lincoln is going to become famous and important in American history. And so nobody really noted it. And Lincoln didn't uh, leave any record of it. So it's just conjecture. It could have happened. And, and, and I should say, that's the only time that it really could have happened because Abraham, there's no, there's no record that Abraham Lincoln visited Nauvoo and, and especially at the time that, uh, that Joseph Smith and, and the Latter-day Saints were there. So, but there, there's, more, there's more to it. If, if read, read the second book uh, like, like Bruce did and, and, and there's more to that story if, if, you, if you're interested. Byron, uh, Steve Patis, um, I wondered if you had read Abe, uh, David Reynolds, uh, highly, highly reviewed um, book on Lincoln. Yeah, yes, I, I, I got it for Christmas. Well, I should say I'm two thirds of the way through it. And, and I have purposely not read any reviews. Uh, I really like David Reynolds. He, he did a really good book on Walt Whitman. Yes. And, a, and an excellent book on um, John Brown. And, and he's a culture, he, he's, a, he's a literary person. He, he's a cultural historian. And, and what he's done with Abe is, is he's placed Abraham Lincoln in the context of the culture of his time. A little bit like what we did tonight, you know, right. looking at, at Cook's Hall and, and all of the things that people were interested in. David Reynolds, you know, does that in his book. Yes. I, he's a fine writer. I, I find him to be very accessible for common folks, even though he's academic. What, what, what's your opinion, Stephen? Well, I, I grew up in Illinois and uh, probably have 80 books on Lincoln. Um, at the time, I learned about this book. It was reviewed in the Wall Street Journal as perhaps the uh, best book ever written on Lincoln. Um, they said there's only one other person in history that's had more books written about them. And that was Jesus Christ. And um, they said there's some 16 or 1700 books on Lincoln. Um, it made me change a little bit my perception of Lincoln and put me in a, a sense of, I wonder if I would have been as big a, an enthusiast in that time um, as I am today of Lincoln. That, that, that's very perceptive. You know, we all like to think that we would have been on the right side of history. And, uh, but you really don't know. You know, I, I, I did my doctoral dissertation on religious dissent during the Civil War uh, in the North. Mm. Uh, Copperhead Christians uh, who, who were, they tended to be Democrats. Yeah. And, and it was a study of, of uh, all of these democratic preachers that were drummed out of their churches because they refused to, to preach Republican war doctrine in, on Sunday. Uh, you know, they, they were good Democrats and, and they didn't want to talk about Republican politics from the pulpit, whereas the majority of, of Protestant ministers in the North did because uh, they saw the Civil War as a holy war. And uh, so in, in doing my research and learning about all of these Copperhead preachers and finding their papers, you know, I would try to track them down there in central Illinois to family members and find them. And without exception, nobody was aware or would admit that their great, great grandparents had not voted for Abraham Lincoln. Oh, of course, and had, and, and had joined some of these Copperhead Christian Democrat churches that, that opposed the war uh, during the Civil War. And, and I would even have letters and things to show, yeah, th this is what your ancestor wrote. And no way. No, I, there, I couldn't find anybody who had ancestors that did not vote for Abraham Lincoln. 
Well, so, if so you, we all uh, like to think that we'd have been on the right side of history. Right. So your perception from, from David Reynolds' book, I, I think, is a good one and one for us to think about today. You know, so. It really is. And, you know, part of the reason you couldn't get anybody to say anything uh, related to the Copperhead preachers is when you grow up in Illinois, you learn math via Lincoln, you learn reading <laughs> via Lincoln, you learn logic via Lincoln. And I, and I mean, how many Lincoln logs does it take to do this or that? I, I mean, I remember it. And uh, so. I'm so happy to have uh, people from Illinois that, that can relate to all of this, so. Well, thank you for your talk. It's very interesting. Two, two or three things that I never knew, and that's great. Does anyone else have any questions, comments? Um, feel free to ask or. Okay. Can I ask? Um... Ryan, what are you working on now? Uh, I'm at the Church History Museum in downtown Salt Lake, and we're in the process of, of planning exhibitions that are going to be in place at the time that the Salt Lake Temple reopens. And so we're very busy, and we've been incredibly busy during the pandemic. We've been closed to the public, but we've been doing lots of long range planning. So, uh, that's, I really appreciate this opportunity tonight to kind of step back out of that and go back to what I did for most of 20 years, which was Illinois and Civil War history and Abraham Lincoln. And uh, it's nice to put my toe back in that for a few minutes. But I invite anyone, please, please come down. When we, we're supposed to reopen to the public on August 2nd and, uh, you know, Come, come and come and visit if you come down. It, it it's a it can be a little tricky with all the construction going on around up uh, around the temple, but you can still park in City Creek and and you can still get around and visit things. So, do you have a uh, email address we could have access to? Uh, my my work one is Brian and. B R Y O N A N D at Church of Jesus Christ dot org. Just one long word, Church of Jesus Christ dot org. Anyone else have any comments or questions? If you want to unmute, you can or put it in the chat, whichever you prefer. Um, well, Brian, thank you again for um, your knowledge and your history and, and everything. Um, we enjoyed having you tonight and uh, we appreciate you, your time and expertise. Thanks for the invitation. It was a lot of fun. Good. Glad. And everyone, good night. Um, thanks for coming. Uh, we appreciate you being here and uh, we'll see you soon. So take care. Have a good night. Thanks. Stay cool. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>